we're going to begin our discussion of the medieval period by turning first to an area of the world that had been known as Byzantium. That Constantine took over and renamed after himself. So as you learned as in the section on the fall of the Roman Empire, two emperors, Diocletian and Constantine, sort of delayed the inevitable. And while Constantine was emperor, he um, pretty much took over this area of the world that had been known as Byzantium, all down in here. And particularly this little area right here, and he renamed it after himself. Now, look at this map, if you will, and hopefully you can see some really good reasons why Constantinople would be the perfect place for Constantine to basically move and set up shop. Um, at this point in the Roman Empire, you pretty much had a divided situation. You had the eastern part of the empire and the western part of the empire. And because of some unrest and constant invasion of the western regions by these folks up here, um, Constantine thought it safer to move here. Now, let's look geographically at why this area um, it is a good place to have a capital city. Um, think about it. It straddled the most traveled land route between Asia, Asia, excuse me, over here, and Europe, over here. It had a very deep water port, so you could get imports and exports quite easily. It was very rich in forest and water. You could get the neighboring agricultural areas to supply an abundance of food. So one of the things that happened as Constant Constantine is establishing Constantinople in this area of the world called Byzantium, you really had a divided empire, divided Roman Empire. You had Byzantium that renamed Constantinople that became the eastern capital of the empire. And by establishing an actual eastern capital, this just further divided the Roman Empire. Constantinople was the center of imperial life in the 5th and the 6th centuries. The actual empire itself lasted here for 1,100 years. They had a very high standard of, of living, supported largely by the silk industry, and they were also the world's richest and largest market for jewelry, metals, ivory, and spices. This, became a very, this was a very, very prosperous um, area of the world. Um, Ravenna in Italy um, became the capital of the western part of the Roman Empire in 402 because of the unrest um, that I told you about earlier. And by the end of the 5th century, Roman power in the West had virtually declined. So everything about the Roman Empire that was prosperous and successful and powerful was occurring in Constantinople or Byzantium. And that was the case until 1453 when it was conquered by the Turks. Now, not only did you have a divided empire, but you had a very divided church. In the West, you have the Roman Catholic Church. They, they spoke Latin in their masses. They were organized structurally with bishops, priests, bishops that ultimately answered to the Pope. And any clergy person that um, operated in the Roman Catholic Church had to take a vow of celibacy. Now, on the eastern end, you had the Byzantine Church. And um, 
During the 1100 years of the Eastern Empire, 450 churches were built and over 340 monasteries. So this was a very religious part of the world. They spoke Greek in their religious services. And instead of having bishops and a pope, um, they had patriarchs. The patriarchs were akin to the bishops in the Roman Catholic Church in the West, but rather than responding or being responsible or answering to the Pope, these folks answered directly to the Emperor. Their clergy people could be married, and unlike the Roman Catholic Church, they had a specific form of worship that involved icons, and, and we will look at some icons specifically and talk about how they incorporated iconography into their worship services. Now, one of the most important emperors after Constantine of this eastern area of the world, this Byzantine area of the world, was an emperor by the name of Justinian. And Justinian began his reign in 527. And Justinian and Theodora were both were very successful rulers, but they were brutal at times. They were not always um, very benevolent, and they went to great measures, including mass killings of people, to maintain their power. So they were successful in the sense that they were prosperous, that they built lots of churches, that they kept this area of the world economically sound, um, but if you disagreed with them, watch out. Now, we put Theodora in here with Justinian um, for a specific reason. Um, she was almost a co-ruler with him, and she was very powerful, she was very important, and that some people liked that, but obviously it, ru it rubbed some people the wrong way. So when we talk about Justinian, we're actually talking about both Justinian and Theodora because she was definitely involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the empire. Now, one of the reasons that they were so popular is they introduced the silk industry into this area of the world. Now, Justinian and Theodora had monks break the Chinese monopoly on the silk industry by smuggling silkworm eggs out of China and bringing them back to Constantinople. Even though Theodora was quite suspect, um, but very influential, what happened with, or what you see happening with the politics and the religion of this time period in this particular part of the world is that there was virtually no separation between church and state. In other words, there was an autocracy, the sense that the rulers were chosen by God to serve as sort of a medium between God and the people. Sort of sounds a lot like the Mesopotamian belief um, centuries and centuries before that the emperor or the ruler was sort of this go-between. Um, and so there was this real blend of politics and religion. Church and state, unlike in the U.S. today, were inextricably connected. Now, Theodora and Justinian closed all the Platonic academies, all the academies that were modeled after Plato and his ideas, because they believed what was being taught there was antithetical to Christianity. While they reigned, they built over 25 churches including probably the most famous church of this period called the Hagia Sophia. 
Justinian and Theodora also revised and codified Roman law. So if you can dial it back a little bit to when in Republican Rome you had the the use Kivile being established that where there was this attempt to put everything all the Roman laws into one um, great book or into one great text well that process continued and it was Justinian and Theodora that finally completed that project so they took they hired a man named Trebonian who was a legal scholar to finish the organization and to clarify any contradictions. So when Trebonian was finished, he came up with basically three divisions of Roman law. The code, which was just a summary of all imperial decrees from the 6th century forward. Um, the Pandix, or the Digest, was a synthesis of legal opinions and scholarship and the institutes which had to deal with criminal law um, and these were basically divided into four categories people's things actions and then personal wrongs so the people's things and actions you can sort of see as our civil laws today or akin to our civil laws today and the personal wrongs akin to our criminal laws today and the institutes are really the basis for modern Western law. Now, let's talk about the church of the um, Haggai or Haye, or you hear it pronounced many different ways, sometimes with the hard G, sometimes without the G at all. But basically, this just translates as holy wisdom. And it was the main church of Constantinople. And the structure itself combined the long shape of a Roman church with the very, very long aisle with the dome center. It was 184 feet tall. And what amazes me is that the records of this church list a total of 600 people assigned to serve in it and you can see the breakdown here what amazes me here is there were 80 priests assigned to serve and work in this particular church and here's a picture of it light was a key element behind the concept because light is a symbol of divine wisdom so the the light in the church um, was to give the sense to the worshipers that they were bathing in God's light. In 1453, when Byzantium or Constantinople was conquered by the Turks, this became a mosque, and it has been a mosque since then. Now, this is a view inside the church, and you can see clearly that the objects suspended from the ceiling are, are ones that are akin to um, Islam and not to any sort of Christian worship. But you can see inside um, how it looks and again how light it was inside. If you can see there's two galleries. This upper gallery up here was for women. The lower one for men. Um, in this early church in um, Byzantium, the men and the women did not worship together. Now, one of the other things that happened um, when um, the Turks conquered is that because in Islam you cannot depict any specific religious figures, they began whitewashing over all the mosaics, the paintings, um, in this particular church. Now this church um, is a museum or the mosque and or they're restoring it and there's just another view of it. And so you can see where they are restoring the mosaics and take you know trying to get rid of the whitewash so you can see them once again. And 
the mosaics themselves was a, were a very important art form um, of this time period in Byzantium. And they were used to instruct. They were used to tell a story. And these mosaics were constructed with thousands of tiny square tiles that were colored. So the artist, instead of painting, would assemble the tiles in a particular pattern to create images. Um, so you can see, and we'll talk about icons in a minute, but I want to show you some of the mosaics in the church um, of the Hagia Sophia. Um, and you can see here, this one is of Christ, and you can see the whitewashing that had been done and now the restoration that is in the process of taking place. There again, you can just see that a little bit closer. So all of these colors here are actually tiny, tiny tiles. This is a mosaic of Justinian and Theodora on each side of Mary and Jesus. And they're bringing gifts. So this whole idea of autocracy, of, of them being important regents, of God on earth is, is very clear here. This is another example of a mosaic. This is in a different church in Ravenna. Um, and just to show you here that these mosaics did have a teaching tool. Um, clearly here Christ is the good shepherd. The one who takes care of his flock and his sheep. Um, and so all of the mosaics were tied to some sort of teaching or instruction um, for the worshipers. Now I want to show you these mosaics in the Church of San Vital because you really see the idea of autocracy played out here. Now these are mosaics of Justinian over here and Theodora. Now if you'll take just a minute to notice Justinian is carrying a loaf of bread and Theodora a chalice. These are the symbols of Christian communion or Christian Eucharist. The body and the blood of Christ are represented by the bread and the wine. So here you have Justinian and Theodora, the emperors, not the priests or the patriarchs, um, being the ones that are bringing the bread and the wine. They are giving the vessels of the Eucharist. Um, so you see them again sort of as this go-between. Now also if you'll notice here which I think is so fascinating you've got Justinian standing right between some significant groups of people. You have state um, figures political figures that would serve with him as well as the army on this side. So you have the governmental figures over here. But then you have the priests over here. So and right in the middle you have Justinian. So again he's this bridge. He's involved in both church and state. Um, and then Theodora as well. You've got um, the priest this, uh, over here and then and then different ladies of different parts of the population. So again these mosaics are, would, would have served as a really good way to remind worshipers, to remind the congregation of the importance of the emperor in their religious lives. And this is just a ceiling in the baptistry of another church in Ravenna. And you can, again, see it's designed to teach and instruct. In the very center, you've got the baptism of Christ by John. And then you have circling apostles around the, the center of it. And so it's reminding the participants, those being baptized, that the church was founded on the apostles by the apostles and that one day the convert would be with them in heaven. 
Now, many monasteries were built during this period of time, and this is a particular one that Justinian built. And the last time I knew, it was still in use. And it does look like a fortress. It's supposed to. And it is built on the site at the bottom of the mountain where Moses supposedly got, according to Christian tradition, the Ten Commandments. One of the interesting things that was found or at St. Catherine's was this particular codex. And this is one of the earliest Greek versions of the New Testament. And it was actually given by the monks in this monastery in 1933 to the Tsar of Russia. But when the Soviets took Russia over and killed off all the Romanovs, they sold it to the British Museum for 100,000 um, pounds. So this is probably from around the 4th century. Um, and you can see that there's no ornamentation. You've got these four columns. The punctuation varies wildly. Um, and so that's how they date it. That's how they say, yeah, this is probably fourth century because of the way it was written. So um, most of the Old Testament is here. The complete New Testament is here. And you also have two additional books, the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. So there are some additional books that aren't in the canonical Bible. Now, I've mentioned icons a couple of times. One in the sense that they were very much a part of the church worship service in these Eastern churches. And also that they were a primary form of art um, in this location as well. And icons were very, very important to the Byzantine church. And iconography itself has a particular artistic method. And that's called an, the encaustic method of painting. And it's just painting with melted wax that's been colored. Okay, so the wax is melted, colored. You paint with it, and then it hardens like wax does. And iconographers, those who did these types of paintings, were considered to have a holy occupation. Their job was to infuse their work with spirituality. So the object here is you've got religious figures. Um, Jesus is here, and let's look at this one first. Um, by staring at, meditating upon the icon, the, worsh the worshiper is supposed to more easily enter into the world of the sacred. The icon itself, because of this full frontal view. And I put this mosaic up here so you could see that this is a method that transferred back and forth. This full frontal view was supposed to speak to the viewer and allow them to worship more in-depthly as if they were staring at the actual person himself or herself. These aren't considered idols, understand. They are considered passageways or helpers to worship. They weren't worshiping the actual icon, but the figure the icon is representing. Um, just like a Christian today might go up to the front of his church and pl pray in front of the a cross that might be hanging there. That person is not worshiping that cross, but is drawing nearer to the God that that cross represents. So it's sort of the same type of thing. And these particular Byzantine styles, iconography, mosaics, will remain popular until the end of the 13th century, when you see early, early Renaissance painters changing these styles, making them less flat and more three-dimensional.
So if you really think about it, you have this incredible realistic art in um, the classical period. And then as you move into the medieval period, you get more idealized, stylized art. But the next thing that comes is the Renaissance, where they start looking back to that classical past. So as people often say, history indeed does repeat itself. <laughs>